Uh, let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, knowing your word is sacred, Lord, and, well, let me say I confess that your word is sacred, and I believe that the scripture is the very words of the living God, inspired by the Holy Spirit through ordinary men, prophets and apostles, who obediently wrote down what God gave them. And I know many of us confess this great truth this morning. As your uh, disciples said, uh, Lord Jesus, where else can we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. So I cling to this word and I pray, Father, that you will, by your spirit, be merciful and gracious to us this morning. That the, the meaning of this passage in First Peter, you would make clear to us. Forgive me what I say that might get in the way and use, Lord, that which is good to point to the truth that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Lift up our hearts to worship him. Make us glad in your presence, Lord, and send us out as your people equipped for good works in your name. For we ask this in the precious name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And together we say, Amen. We are continuing in our series in 1 Peter. And the series we titled, or I should say I titled, because it was really just my choice, uh, we titled the series Becoming People of Peace in a Post-Christian Culture. At Beacon Communities, we believe that uh, God has us here for a purpose to influence our part of the city and one day by his will, by his grace, maybe larger portions of the city. I would love to plant another church, not myself, but send out a team to plant another church. This one was hard enough. And uh, I'd like to leave that to a younger man uh, to go out and plant a church uh, and help them out, you know, give them people and money to do so one day. Uh, and uh, we see part of a church church planting movement that's going on not only across Canada but right here in Victoria there are more and more church plants at various parts of the city and God be praised the gospel is going forth but if we are ever going to make a significant impact on our culture it will not be by getting people to come into church it will be by sending Christians out into the world equipped equipped so that they understand the gospel they understand how to share the gospel in a way that makes sense to ordinary men and women they work with, they go to school with, they live next door to. And we believe God is raising up a people of peace, not only in Canada, but around the world. And that is called the church, and it has always been that way. There was a time, as I recall, in around our first year of marriage, when Heather and I were getting worried because I had been laid off recently. Uh, we had no money, like no money. Think about how much money you have. It was a lot less than that. We had no money. My prospects seemed to dry up. I had no education. Didn't even have a grade 12 uh, diploma. I had a graduation equivalency degree or di certificate. And finally, anyway, uh, as I explored job options, I, I got out there. I put out my resume. I knocked on doors. I answered every ad I could find. Finally, well, every door seemed to close in my face until one. It looked like I had a job. In, well, I did have a job interview at the pulp mill in Crofton where my father-in-law worked for many years, 20-something years by that time. And, uh, and I got a job interview at the Crofton Pulp Mill and Heather and I thought this could be it. Security. Reliability. A good income, a good living. I mean, $22 an hour. It, it blew my mind. <laughs> Thanks, Claire. And I don't remember if Heather was pregnant at that time or if we were expecting a baby, probably both, uh, uh, honestly. Um, but uh, maybe you can re relate to the stress that a young uh, husband and father feels to try to provide for his family. Well, I got this interview and it went really well. It went really, really well and I was so, we were both so excited. Um, uh, I got called back for a follow-up interview. And that also looked like the job was mine and it looked like our worries were over. We put a lot of eggs in that basket. There are many moments in life when it, we are faced with a tough decision, a, a test of our faith, when we're suddenly afraid to do the right thing. At that second or third job interview at the pulp mill, 
the manager that I was uh, that was interviewing me said everything looked good and we could go ahead and start filling out the paperwork. <laughs> you can imagine the happiness that I felt. And then he said, oh, oh, there was one final question he had forgotten to ask. Had I ever had back pain? Now let me tell you, I had had regular back pain from the time I was a child until about the time I was 30 years old. And the, the thought went through my head and I was suddenly very afraid that if I told the truth, I felt I could lose the job. Then what would I tell Heather? She was so excited. The job was mine. I think she was already celebrating. What would I go back and say to my pregnant wife, to my in-laws? Well, I admitted the truth about my back, and I lost the job. And the thing is, Christianity is all well and good when it works, right? But what about when following Christ means not getting that job? It was a small thing to tell the truth. But it felt like if I know Jesus is Lord, if I believe his word, how can I tell a lie to keep the job? It felt like that. What about when following Christ means something worse than just not getting a job? What do we trust? Do we trust God? Do we fear him because we think it's a way to get what we want? Or do we trust God's goodness and grace no matter what it costs us? Look with me in 1 Peter chapter 3 at verse 13 and 14. <clears throat> Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. So far in Peter's letter to these churches that today we call modern Turkey, but they were scattered around the area there. He has shown us that we don't need to do evil to get ahead if we really believe God is taking care of us. He's shown us that we don't need to lie our way out of trouble, to use deceit, if we really believe that God is watching over us. He's shown us that we don't need to hurt people to get what we want. If we really believe that God is good and if it's true that he loves us. And in chapters 2 and 3 so far, Peter had been showing us how to live in light of God's grace. In light of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that all of our relationships begin to be affected and changed because of what Jesus has done for us. Does it make any difference at all that I'm a Christian? Does it make any difference in how I live with my wife? Does it make any difference in how we treat our employers or our employees? Does it make any difference in what we fill out on a job application form? Or what we do with our income tax return and aha, it's that time of year, I've got to now. Does Jesus make any difference? What's the point of saying he's risen at Easter if there is no difference? Peter believes there must be a difference. And he's shown us that if what we believe is true, he's shown us that if this gospel that he outlined so well in chapter 1, if it's true, then whether it's with our relationships with unbelievers in our city, chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, whether it's with the authorities over us, chapter 2, verse 13, whether it's with our masters, if we happen to be slaves, chapter 2, verse 17, whether it's with our spouse, chapter 3, verse 1 and 7, all of our relationships must be changed. The gospel can make a big difference, but there's an if and that's what we're talking about this morning. The gospel will only make a big difference if we don't give in to fear. So what are we afraid of? That's my heading trying to capture what I see in verses 13 to 15. 
And this is where we find out whether our faith is genuine or not. I am so frustrated every time I hear media kind of celebrities like Oprah talk about faith. I am so frustrated by that. As if faith is some kind of power we tap into and if we've got enough of it, it works for us. That is absolutely nothing to do with what the Bible describes about faith. Nothing at all. It's not even the same concept, much less is it just differently applied. It's it's not the same idea whatsoever. I've said it many times that faith in the New Testament idea and in the Old Testament idea is basically the idea of where you put your confidence, what you rely on, that the act of relying on something, and we all do all the time, is an act of faith. So the point of biblical faith is not how much reliance do we have or how good our quality of depending on something is, how intensely we try to depend on something, with what sincerity of heart we believe. That's not the point. The point is in whom we believe. And that's the only point. If you believe just a little bit, Or if you believe the size of a mountain. The point is the God in whom we trust. A mustard seed or a kingdom. It's the God in whom we trust. That's the point of biblical faith. And we see this in verse 13. Peter calls us to think about who or what we are afraid of. You see that there in verse 13. Now who is there to harm you? If you are zealous for what, for what is good. And he's, he's saying you will be zealous for what, of good if you re, for what is good if you really believe the gospel. In other words, if you've, if you've bought everything he's sold so far up to the beginning of chapter 3. You'll, you'll, be, you'll have, have a newborn and a growing zeal for good, for righteousness. Because of the work God is doing in your heart. Even if it's only beginning to think, I'd like to do good. At the very beginning of your Christian story. It will grow into zeal over the course of a Christian life. But he's saying, what are you afraid of? If we are zealous for what is good, if we are depending on God's grace, then honestly, what could possibly go wrong? If our prayers really rise up to God, like the husband, it says about husbands in verse 12, if, if, we're, if we're praying to God, what do we have to worry about? What could possibly happen to make us stop praying to God? If Jesus really died for our sins and we're reconciled to the Father by his righteousness and by his sacrifice, we're covered by his atonement, then what else could, what wheel can possibly fall off that wagon? If you're zealous for what is good, what are you afraid of? Who is there to harm you? What would make us take our eyes off of God? Peter suggests it's fear. Fear of something else or someone else other than fear of God. Look with me at the end of verse 14 uh, through to the beginning of verse 15. He says, have no, in the English Standard Version it reads like this, and other translations take this differently, but it says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. We're going to spend some time right on that uh, string of words there. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. And if you've got a different translation, you can see that various translations have trouble with this uh, particular passage and try to express it in different ways. There are two options here, Peter is saying, or for, for two options for what is in our hearts. Something's in our hearts. It's one thing or another. When things go wrong, either we are afraid and troubled without God, that's verse 14. Or we are 
uh, honoring Christ the Lord as holy in our hearts. Something is in our hearts. It's either fear or it's honor. It's fear of something or it's honor for Christ. One thing or another will be in our hearts at every point we reach a critical impasse where a decision is called for that tests whether or not this Christian thing is true. Two paths we can walk, two roads we can take. I almost feel like quoting that poem, two paths diverged in a wood and I took the one less traveled by. Either the same fears that unbelievers are controlled by will be in our hearts or a holy reverence for Christ as Lord will be in our hearts. And Peter puts these things as two distinct contrasts. Read those words again with me just so you can see what Peter's done here. At the end of chapter 3 verse 14, have no fear of them nor be troubled. Same sentence but in your hearts. But in your hearts. They've got fear in their hearts but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy. Something's going on in our hearts. Which is it? If Christ rules our hearts, we will act one way. If fear of anything else rules our hearts, we will act another way. So the next heading I have is that the fear of the Lord frees us from fearfulness. I don't know where you're coming from this morning. Some of you I do, to be honest, because I know most of you. But there is a few of you that I don't know well. So I don't know how you approach church, how you think about the Bible. Let me just give you the benefit of the, of the doubt and say, you know, you may not yet really agree with all of this, and that's okay. If we want to understand the Bible, though, not if we want to all agree and get along, I'm not so much interested in that. I'm more interested right now in this next, you know, 25 minutes, optimistically, I'm more interested in what does the Bible say? And can we agree together that what I'm trying to say this morning is what this passage of scripture is saying? Don't worry about whether it's true or not yet. Let's deal with whether what this is actually saying before we decide whether it's true. But if we can disagree that we're approaching this text of scripture to understand it, and if we can agree then that we want to understand it, and, and to say, you know, I'm not going to let myself get offended at what it says, just keep reminding ourselves what it means first. Then when we come to a word like fear, we have to admit that most of our culture always talks about the idea of fear as a bad thing. Right? But the Bible doesn't. Most of our culture looks at fear as always a negative. But unless we're, like, there are, time, there are exceptions. Like when we're teaching little kids about the dangers of, like, moving cars and hot stoves and uh, electrical outlets and strange dogs, then there's a healthy fear that we want to teach, like toddlers, right? Don't touch. Ouch. Ouch. Hot. Hot. Remember my kids, especially Daniel, going, hot, hot, hot. Where does the time go? Yeah, and you're saying, well, it's going right now. Yeah. But we have an idea of a healthy fear. But in the minds of the prophets who gave us the scriptures, the most dangerous thing that you could do is not to stick a fork in an electrical outlet or run out into moving traffic. The most dangerous thing you could possibly do was to live your life ignorant and ignoring the holy God of the universe. There was nothing else more dangerous. That trumped everything. Because God is holy and just. When you, when you think about what those two words mean, he's always right. He's, his justice always is followed through on. He's never the corrupt judge that just excuses or takes a bribe or lets someone off. He is holy in his character. He cannot be bribed. He cannot be bought. He will always see that justice is done. God is holy. If God is holy and just, as he showed the prophets that he is, he will one day finally solve the problem of evil and judge the world. 
But he also showed another side of himself. Not an opposite side, but more of his holiness in showing that he is also merciful and loving. And so he has provided a way to still deal with our sin, to deal with our guilt, and save us from judgment day. He sent Jesus to save sinners. And the heart of every Christian must just melt at that one word. Look at verse 18. Peter is about to go there. And this is my sermon next week. I'm giving you a prelude. In verse 18 he says, For Christ also suffered once for sins. Once. One time. For all sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. In other words, him for us. Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. The end of chapter 2 said that we would be returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. That's who God is. That's who the prophets knew him to be. The apostles realized he is in Jesus Christ. That's what the message of the Bible is about. So the scripture says, fear God. And it's not a bad thing. To fear God is never negative, but 100% positive in the scripture's point of view. We might not see it that way yet, but let's just admit that's what the scriptures portray. To fear God is to realize the danger of ignoring God and to therefore run into the arms of Jesus, the Savior he gave us. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I knew many of you would know that verse. And then Proverbs 9.10 goes on in the way of Hebrew poetry, laying two ideas side by side to compare or contrast. The Proverbs 9.10 said at the beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the rest of the verse says that the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So follow this with me here and you can look at 9.10, Proverbs 9.10 if you need to, but you've got the fear of the Lord that leads to wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One that leads to insight. They're the same thing. The fear of the Lord is to know the Holy One. To know Him. Who He really is. They produce wisdom. They produce insight. This is not negative. This is positive. It is the way of wisdom and insight. And we've seen from 1 Peter so far that up until now, Peter was showing how faith in Christ changes our various relationships. In other words, how our relationship with God affects every other relationship. We know this to be a true principle. That a significant relationship changes your other relationships. Guys, how many of us before we were, before we were married, before, when we would sit in a restaurant and there was a cute waitress, how many of us would flirt? My hand is going down. I'm not putting up my hand. I've done it. Usually because they initiated. <laughs> Okay, now I'm lying. Now I'm lying. But let me tell you, I went on a date one time with Heather, right around the time when we got engaged, and the waitress began flirting. Do you know what I did? I flirted right back at her. I always had. Do you know how much trouble I got in? (laughs) A significant relationship changes our other relationships. That's just a girlfriend or fiancé at that time. But she made an immediate impact on how I related to other women. And she still does, let me tell you. If you have a child, for the first time, suddenly you drive differently when there's a baby in the back seat, don't you? Your relationships, the more significant, the more powerful they are, they affect our other relationships. I could go on, and I thought of quite a few funny ones, but we'll just leave it at that. It is in relationships with other human beings that our faith is frequently put to the test. And when that moment comes, will we act with wisdom and insight that comes from the fear of the Lord and the true knowledge of the Holy One? Or will we do something else? Will we act foolishly and let ourselves be controlled by the kinds of things unbelievers are afraid of? And I put it that way on purpose. Because of what Peter says in verse 14. 
Let me read verse 14 with you then and then point out a couple of things. The end of verse 14 rather says, Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. There is a significant translation issue here that you may have already tuned into if you've got a different uh, version of the scriptures. The King James Bible has this right, actually. It says in the King James, Do not fear, do not fear their terror. Or if you happen to be carrying my favorite old Reformation Bible, the Geneva Bible, which existed before the King James was published, then the Geneva Bible says, Fear not their fear. Fear not their fear. Don't be afraid of their terror. Don't be afraid of their fears. The Greek literally says, have no fear of their fear, or have no fear of the fear of them. And the reason this sounds awkward and is difficult to translate is because it's just a fragment of a quote from an Old Testament passage that Peter's brought straight forward here. And that quote is from Isaiah chapter 8 verse 12. And when you see that passage in Isaiah and you see what Isaiah was talking about that Peter quotes here, then this awkward reading makes a lot more sense. So if you have, um, you can if you want. Turn to Isaiah chapter 8 and look with me at verses 12 to 13 and I'll start at verse 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me. I want to read that again. For the Lord spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, this is what the Lord said to him, do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy and do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. That passage is exactly what Peter has said here in verse 14 and 15. Do not fear their fear, nor be troubled. Do not fear the fear that they fear. Don't share their fears, or be troubled. But honor the Lord of hosts as holy. And look how Peter puts it. But honor, in the ESV, it's a little bit different. Honor Christ the Lord as holy. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. The unbelievers in Judah, in the passage that Isaiah is quoting, or in Isaiah 8, the unbelievers in Judah at that time were afraid of the rumors of a conspiracy of two kingdoms ganging up on their kingdom. Two kingdoms, uh, Syria and northern Israel, ganging up, joining forces against the kingdom of Judah. And then in the previous chapter, they found out that the Assyrian Empire was on its way. God had raised up the Assyrian Empire and was sending them to uh, conquer Syria and Israel. And so Judah would be delivered. And you would think that people would praise God for his deliverance. But that's not what happened. People were giving Assyria the credit for their rescue. They were giving this empire the credit. And instead of being thankful and giving the glory to the God who was promising to send this empire to rescue them. How stubborn could they be, hey? Not like us at all. Imagine how strange it would be to trust the means of salvation instead of the Savior behind the means. We would never do that. It's like putting confidence in a wooden cross instead of the Savior who died on the cross. Or in the power of prayer. Oh, in the power of prayer instead of the God we pray to. Or in the means of faith instead of the object of our faith. And that was what was wrong with the faith of the people of Judah in Isaiah 8. Not that they didn't have any faith, but that their faith was misplaced. So God told Isaiah to tell the people in verses 12 to 13, don't fear what other fears, don't be troubled like they are, but trust in Yahweh. That's the capital L-O-R-D in the Old Testament. Trust in Yahweh. The Lord over all armies. He says, Yahweh, and you see that there, the Lord of hosts. That doesn't mean... Never mind. That, that, that mean, the hosts means armies. The, the Lord over all the armies of the earth. The Lord who is ultimate in his power. So again, picture this. So you've got the kingdom of Judah worried because two kingdoms in the north will band together and they'll have a bigger army. 
right? So the kingdom with the little army is worried about the two kingdoms with the slightly bigger army. And then they're happy because another empire with a much bigger army is going to come and rescue them by defeating the two kingdoms with the slightly bigger army. You're with me still fo- so far? And then Isaiah says, don't worry about them. Really, they're afraid, afraid of that. They shouldn't be. Fear the Lord of hosts, the Lord of all armies. He's got the biggest army. Just by point of comparison. And I want to just say something about fear. Even if your fear of God was entirely negative, totally negative, with no positive outcome at all, it's still wise. When you think about all the threats that can possibly happen to us, all the dangers that could possibly happen to us when we walk outside the doors here, or if we stay in our seats and a meteor falls on us. Whatever we could possibly be afraid of, and the list is endless. There is nothing more fearful than the God who exists, the God who creates everything and upholds the universe by the word of his power. The sovereign Lord who rules over everything is the only one we should fear even if it's only entirely negative. You don't fear the little guy, you fear the big guy with the stick. And that's such a horrible comparison, I pray God forgives me for even using it. But God is so much stronger and more powerful than the big guy with the stick. Don't be afraid of the things that they're afraid of, God said to Isaiah. Don't be disturbed by them. Fear God. Fear Him, Yahweh. And Peter applies that directly to Jesus Christ in verse 15. What's Peter's point? His point is that 800 years after Isaiah, Yahweh, the Lord of armies, was born in the flesh in Bethlehem as Jesus the Christ. Peter's point is that people with misplaced faith are frightened by all the wrong things all the time. But well-placed faith, well-placed, not misplaced, really well-placed faith, rightly placed faith, is specifically in who our true Savior really is. Fear Him. The Lord God did not only send Jesus Christ to us. Jesus Christ is the Lord God who died for us who took our sins in his body on the tree, as Peter said, who has brought us back to the shepherd and overseer of our souls himself, Peter said in chapter 2. So looking in hope to Jesus Christ, putting our confidence in Christ, seeing him for who he is, as Proverbs 9.10 said, the knowledge of the Holy One is insight, knowing who he really is. So that nothing else has any more power to shake us. Nothing else ever again has any more power to frighten us as long as Jesus Christ is Lord. That's what it means to fear God. Christ the Lord, Peter says in verse 15, you see it there, he says he's holy. Honor him as holy. Which means he is perfect in every way. The songs that have been sung and the poetry that has been written and the books that expose this wonderful truth. He is perfect in every way in his holiness. He is perfect in his righteousness. He is merciful. He is forgiving. He is gentle. He is strong. He is patient. He is just. He is sovereign. He is all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful. He is creator God and king of kings. He is ruler over heaven and earth, over history, over destiny, over eternity, over you and over me. And that rhymed. (laughs) If the gospel, my friends... If the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, tells us he will forgive anyone who asks for mercy, and it does tell us that. If his word assures us he will save anyone who calls on his name, and it does give us that assurance. 
if his apostles and prophets proclaimed that anyone who believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. And it does. Then since he is faithful and sovereign, there is literally nothing else to be afraid of. So, when we are afraid, when our souls are troubled, like verse 14 says not to be, then I suggest to you that it is always because we have forgotten for a moment who Jesus Christ is. We've forgotten the knowledge of the Holy One. We've forgotten Yahweh of hosts. We've forgotten the God of Israel. We've forgotten who Jesus Christ is, that he is Lord. And he's no longer being elevated for that moment as Lord in our hearts. Something else has moved in. Oh, my friends, the solution is so simple. When you're afraid of the dark, turn to the light. I didn't say turn on the light. He's already on. Turn to the light. Just just turn. Stop facing the dark and turn. Turn from the little guy to the king of kings. Just turn to the light. Which leads me to my next very cleverly worded point. Courageous Christians are prepared. What, I, I could have used alliteration there, but I thought that would be very corny. What would it look like if our hearts were no longer agitated? All the, you know what they call that thing in the middle of your clothes washer? The washing machine? You know that thing that they call the, It's an agitator. You know what it does to the water? It agitates it. Have you ever opened the lid and watched it? Ours is partly broken, so you can open the lid and watch it. <laughs> and when you do, that water is going all over. The, it's severely agitated water. Look at verse 14. Do not fear their fear or be troubled. You know what that word troubled means? You guessed it. Agitated. Tossed about. Disturbed. Like water. When it's boiling or whatever. (laughs) What if our hearts were no longer agitated by all the numerous fears like that washing machine all the time? Tossing us around confusing us, troubling our hearts deeply? What if, what if our hearts were like pools of calm, quiet water that, that only God was big enough to disturb? What if our hearts were like that? And that's the picture behind that word troubled in verse 14. Peter is saying that if Christ rules supreme over the waters of our hearts, our hearts can find peace no matter what storm rages on the outside. I like movies where some disaster strikes. I love disaster movies. Usually it's Dwayne Johnson to the rescue. But the thing I like is seeing in these movies, these disaster action movies, when everybody panics except that one guy, usually with the hat. And and the one guy, he knows what to do. Everybody runs the wrong way. He runs the right way. Everybody is dying and buildings are falling on them. He's wise. He's rescuing people on his way to safety. I love those movies. When followers of Christ have for 2,000 years gone against the flow and acted with purpose and strength as if they could see things others can't, as if they knew something other people don't know, not alarmed by the things that alarm the rest of the world, but stabilized and encouraged by their hope in Jesus Christ. It has frequently throughout history confused people. It has frequently made books to be written or inquisitions to be launched, demanding an answer, how come? Sometimes it draws good attention, sometimes it draws unwelcome attention, but it gets noticed And now I put this in black and white terms just for the point of explaining it. But you and I both know that no books are probably going to be written by us. Or about us, I mean. We might write some books. Brian wrote a book. (laughs) 
you and me are not, you, you and I are not yet free from these worries that trouble our hearts, from the worries of the world and the things that other, everybody else worries about. They frighten us too. But you know, the more reasons that we find in Scripture to put our confidence in Jesus, the more we grow in the peace that he brings. And as that grows, that peace, the Holy Spirit through Peter commands us to prepare ourselves for what will come. Be prepared to share the gospel. Look at verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. When death or losing a job or sickness or threats against your person or a stock market crash or even a war won't make us panic. When injustice or insult or wrong done against us don't have the same kind of power over us to make us lash out and give them back a taste of their own medicine. When those things rule us less than they used to. People will notice and they will wonder what makes you and me different. And this is when we share our own gospel. Not a different gospel. Not a unique gospel. Not a gospel other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, not, not a different gospel. But we share that it's our own gospel. We share about what is particularly relevant to us. What, is, what it means that this gospel is good news to me. Right now, with what I'm going through in life, why it gives me such confidence to react differently, to not be so troubled and agitated, to respond like I know something others don't know, to respond like I know God is still on his throne and he will not abandon the one Jesus died to save. That's the gospel we share at a time like that. So Isaiah can say in chapter 8, yes, I'm afraid of being attacked by another country, but if you knew Yahweh, if you knew Yahweh, who he really is, you wouldn't be so afraid of that. And Peter's saying something so much better. That the Yahweh who is right there for Judah has rescued us forever by dying for us. We know him as Jesus. His spirit has made him known to our hearts and minds. Praise the Lord. So any one of us might say something like, yes, my cancer is scary. I wake up at night sometimes afraid. But let me share with you why and how right now I'm more confident in Christ than I am afraid of cancer. So when people notice we aren't afraid of the same things they are and they ask us, we need to tell them not just that we have hope, but why we have hope. Point it to the gospel. And then what our hope is. Point to the results of the gospel. And secondly here, be prepared to give God the glory. Look with me at verse 15 to 16 again. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. I think the reason Peter used the word 
make a defense here. Give an apology in Greek. It's not because we're Canadians and we say sorry all the time. Nothing like that. I think it's because it's a legal word that comes from the context of the court. And I think it's because there will be many times when the people asking us will be in positions of authority and we will be in trouble. And as I look back over history, it's often been that way. In verses 15 and 16, Peter links together how we respond with a good conscience. So it's not just our message that points people to God, is it? It's not just our message. It's our manner that also should glorify God. Similar to what Peter said to husbands in verse 7, that how we treat our wives is directly linked to the fact that we know God is watching us when we pray. Likewise, when Christian courage makes someone wonder, what makes you tick? Don't wreck your explanation by giving the answer back with rudeness or arrogance or condescension, disrespecting them, much less with impatience or anger towards them. Even when you're in trouble, even at gunpoint, The respect we show them is as important as the reason we give them. Especially when it's our good behavior that is being misunderstood. You remember what chapter 2 verse 12 said. As Peter's key theme for this part of the book. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles, among the nations honorable. So that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. This is about God's glory. Because our goal is God's glory that people would know the Holy One. So no matter what kind of storm is blowing around us, and they blow, don't they? They rage. We always have, we always have a rock. We always have a true north to find our way. This is the glory of God. We glimpse it through the scripture. We see it full in the face of Jesus Christ. A righteous life, my friends, is evidence. It's evidence before the court. A righteous life is evidence that tells people God is worth obeying. He's righteous. A generous life tells people God is generous. Courage shows that God is bigger than any other fear. Even when Christians suffer because of doing good, that's verse 17, it points back to God, showing that we value Him more than our own comfort, so we are willing to suffer. We value Him more than our mortal lives, so we will follow Him even through death. How we live glorifies God when how we live is empowered by the gospel that God gave us. Look at verse 17 as we come to a close. For it is better. It's so much better. I can't believe Peter's so understated here. I can't believe he just uses a simple word of comparison. It's better. Look at it. For it is better to suffer for doing good. If that should be God's will. A big if. Suffering isn't always God's will for you. Don't assume that it is and be whatever they call that when a person who wants to suffer all the time. But if there's no way around it, no way around it without sacrificing the gospel, without being silent about Jesus, without continuing to bear witness to him, if your witness for Jesus requires you to go through suffering, and it often does, then it is God's will. Verse 17, it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. Christ is worth it. So in our hearts and in our lives, 
Will we honor Christ the Lord as holy? By way of a prayer in closing, I want to read from Romans 8. Maybe the worship team could come and could we stand together? Let us hear these words of scripture and would you join me in committing to honor Christ the Lord as holy in our hearts? With these words, what shall we then say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is now at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.